following presentation was made at the Opryland Hotel in Nashville, Tennessee, for Caller Lab's 16th Annual Convention, 1989. Music session. <laughs> you know, we, we, thank you. We, this is our music session, and um, what I would like everybody to do right now is, because it is music, will everybody say, la, la, la. Lee, Lee, Lee. This side alone. La, la, la. This side, Lee, Lee, Lee. Both of them together now. You were right. There isn't one caller here that we could use on our label. We were just making a check. And they still come in. All right, here we go, gang. What, what our session uh, is going to be on music, and we're going to try to keep it as short as we can. And where you can ask any question you want. And if we can't answer it, we will certainly get the answer for you before the weekend is over. And I mean any question. I don't care if it's a gripe about my label, which I'm sure there wouldn't be, but maybe on them too. Uh, please feel free. If there's something in music you'd like to know about or something doesn't feel right, you have a suggestion. So when it's your time to talk, please feel free to, uh, at any time, to, to uh, ask a question. What we're going to try to do... We're going to try to cover programming a dance, the ups and downs or the highs and lows of programming, and also of the music itself, when it's good to keep somebody up or when it's good to keep somebody down. Uh, also, the changes that are happening in our music, and you know there are some big changes. Some of you say you don't like it, and that's our digital sampler versus synthesizers. Okay, It's happening, and we're going to explain more about that. How to select a record. A record. I'm going to cover that, and I think that's very important, especially after again this year to see why some callers are listening to records and listening to the music. Uh, we hope that that's going to help you. We're going to try to cover rhythm, perhaps, uh, what rhythm is, and melodies. Smooth flow, if we can have the time. Music arrangement, if we have the time. And again, if you want to know anything about recording or recording studios, we'll do that. Before I introduce one of these two gentlemen... I want to say very strongly, you do not have to be a musician to understand anything we're saying or even to be a caller, as most of you know, but I do want to clarify that. <laughs> there are three very important parts of music that I want you to listen to or keep in mind. Many of you may know it, but keep it in mind when we're talking about the music and that when you're listening or something is being explained, you may want to keep these three basic ingredients in your mind. And they're simple ingredients. It's rhythm. It's melody and it's harmony. Those are the three, basic three, I like to call them in music. Rhythm is a cadence or the driving force that makes our dancers go. It's the high, it's the repetitive of high uh, and low continuous sounds. That's rhythm. It doesn't do anything else. I looked up the definition to melody because I really didn't know how to tell you what it was and I love this definition. A sweet or agreeable succession of of arrangements of sound, better put, is the sweet end of the lollipop. That's the melody. Harmony is most often misunderstood. Most of you, when you hear callers doing duets, they do harmony, you think that's what it is. Maybe singing in thirds with another caller. That's not true. Harmony comes in all kinds of ways, and we're going to let you hear some of definite harmony. It comes in chords behind the melody. Harmony means any notes desisting from the rhythm or from the melody, doing something to complement those other two ingredients. Be it a run behind the music, some cute little things happening, that's all part of harmony. So, without any, fur any uh, further delay, I'm going to introduce to which one of you guys are going to go first, so I can read your three and four page descriptions. Uh, he's bowing to either ugliness or age, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> I, I had thought for sure that the young kid would go first, but I guess I'm wrong. Um, I really shouldn't have to read from this, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to, because the next young man has uh, done a lot for our music with his label. Dick Weibel and his wife Becky do have the labels Rawhide and, um, help me out, Dick, Buckskin. I just want to see if you were paying attention. Dick does a number of festivals. He does arrange and does his own music, as you know. Um, some of his credits include Kings Valley Resort in California, Lion's Head Dance in Dance Ranch. He is a member. 
hard-working member of Caller Lab. He prides himself on his command, precise timing, and keen sense of rhythm. You can tell that by his music. And he does organize tours. Without further ado, let's have a nice hand for Mr. Dick Weibel. Does this go up? <laughs> well, I can't get down the hole that you're in. Oh. You have to help old guys. Oh, Lord. This is going to be a day. Just it. Can I do this? Do you mind? Help me a little bit uh, to get an idea of what we have in here. How many of you are have been calling for five years or more? Just give me a show of hands, huh? Great, great. How many f under five years? Well, that's good too. That's good too. That's great. Good. And then we have Larry Cole. <laughs> what I'm going to talk about is programming music. Music that you use is basically crowd control. You're controlling your crowds. You're controlling your groups with your music. And one thing you want to put up here in the top of your head, up in this computer thing that you have up here, is dancers dance to the music. They don't dance to your calling. They don't dance to your voice. They dance to music. And that's your control mechanism. Now, you can go out and call a dance and not use any music, but just try to, you know, put a picture in your head. What would it be like to call a dance with no music? You're just up there saying the words. So your music is your crowd control. And what it, what it does, it establishes the dancer's mood or the dancer's mental attitude for that entire evening. From the first tip or from the time they come into the dance to the entire time that they're dancing until they leave. And you're working on this mental attitude of that dancer. And you can make it an upper, a downer, a middle of the road. You, whatever you want, you can do to that dancer and you can do it with your music. Basically, I think choreography supports the music more than I think that music supports the choreography. Now, this is my own personal opinion, but think of it that way. The psychological control that you have of the people out there with the music that you use. And just stop and think to yourself, you've got certain singing calls that if you're, let's say you've got a group and, ah, they're just, no, no, no. You know, they're, they're not doing what you want them to do. You're going to throw that piece of music on there and you're going to use it. And what does it do? It lifts them up or... Or you've, you've had a dance and all of a sudden they come up and say, we're going to break right here and have a refreshment period. And you think, oh God. And what happens? 30 minutes, then you bring them back on the floor and they're not the same, are they? They don't have the same mental attitude. They don't have the same feeling towards you as they did before that break. So don't you have some special records that you have learned to use that you can put on there that what? Tries to get them back up on that apex that you're working for. So music is your crowd control. Music sets your mental attitude. So now you want to program your music and you want to program your hoedowns and you want to program your singing calls. Both. Now think of it. A lot of guys don't program hoedowns. But I do. I program my hoedowns and I program my singing calls. Now, how do you program a hoedown, or how do you program a singing call? Before you can even begin programming it, you have to know what you've got. You have to know what that record is. You know, you just can't walk over here and pick this, this record up here and throw it on the turntable and start doing it. You've got to know what's in there to be able to program it. Thank you for letting me use that. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. So let's take hoedowns. Start with that one. And I'm going to give you a system that I use. I'm not saying it's the right system. I'm not saying it's the wrong system. I'm not telling you to use it. What I'm going to share with you is how I do it. It works for me. It works well. I have to, things don't come easy to me. I have to work hard. A lot of guys can, and I've seen them, I've worked with them. They'll just grab a bunch of records and throw them on the turntable. Gee, you know, they've just got a natural ability to know what to do at the right time and what to use. I don't. I have to work hard at it. So this system Take it for what it is. If there's anything in there that you can use, use it. Extrapolate out of it. Adjust it to fit your need. I take my hoedowns and I put them into three categories. Category number one is, and I label it standard. These are standard hoedowns that I know I can grab any time, throw on the turntable. table. It's going to work. The dancer is going to be able to dance to it, and I can call to it. There's no problem. Now, all of us have record cases, don't we? 
We all use record cases. I don't know how I don't know how many records that you have that are running. I use 300 records. That's how many records I have that are constantly working in and out of my system. Some of them are pretty old. Some of them are new. But my record cases, I set up a filing system. My hold downs are in one area. My singing calls are in another area. Now, my hold downs, first category, standard. And I know they're old familiars that I can throw on any time. Now, I file them in jackets. And on that jacket, if you go down, what I use is I go down to the stationery store and I get these iridescent stick-on labels and I stick it on the jacket and I just write across it in a felt-tip pen what it is. It's a standard. Then I take the record and the side that I use, I put that same iridescent sticker on there so, you know, I wear glasses. I reach that stage of maturity where the good Lord is exchanging wisdom for eyesight, but... Uh... <laughs> no, uh-uh. But then I can pull that record out, and I can just throw it on a turntable. I can I know what side. I don't have to go down, down and start looking, get my bifocals up here, get my trifocals out and look at it. So that's a system that you can use. The next category is what I label special. Now, these are special hoedowns, and I have them in their own section, and it's labeled special. Again, I have a sticker on there, and I've written the word special across it. Number one in the special, four razors. Now, these are hoedowns that will raise the floor. You know, it has the type of thing that will raise you, and it will raise your dancers. They can sense it. They can feel it. First tip hoedowns. I have certain hoedowns that I use for the first tip of the evening and no other time. I like them for that first tip. And we can talk about it, and we will later on about first tip. What are you going to do with the first tip? Also, I have what I call pulse changers, and that means just pulse in here. Hold downs that will change the pulse of the dancer. It could be a rhythmical change, a different rhythm than what we normally use. Now, each one of those hold downs on that sticker, I'll say special, then underneath it, I'll put pulse quickener or rhythm change or floor razor or first tip. It's there. So I, I don't have to go searching through there. I can just lift it out, and I know what I've got. Next category are workshop hold downs. Now, we've all done workshops. Now, from workshops, I label, I have three categories under workshop. Number one is class. Classes that I'm teaching. I want certain hoedowns when I'm teaching classes. I like hoedowns that have a good, solid beat. Something that, and I will actually, you know, actually do whatever I can to make that beat more predominant and come out. Because I want those new dancers to be able to pick up that rhythm. I don't care how pretty it is or how pretty I sound to it, but I have certain hoedowns that I use for my classes. It makes a difference in your teaching. It really does. It's a lot easier to teach when dancers can learn to start feeling that music and rolling with it and moving with it. Well, you've seen me teach, you know. You mean there. Workshops. Now, if I'm going to do a workshop at a festival or in my regular advanced or plus or mainstream workshops, I have certain records I use in my workshops. Again, I look for records that have a good solid beat, maybe a little more melodic. Or if I'm, the next category is hard material. If I'm doing a club level dance or a, or a, or a Saturday night dance somewhere, and whatever tip it is, I'm going to use some choreography that's very difficult. Now, to a point where I know it's hard material, I know I've got to work with the dancers, I have special hold downs that will not detract. They will aid the dancer to dance but will not detract from what I'm saying so that the dancer can get through it. They will not override what we're doing. Those are the three under that. So let's look at them again. Standards. And they're all just old favorites. Next category is special. Under there are three categories. Four razors, first tips, pulse changers. Last grouping, workshops. Classes, workshop teaching, and hard material. Singing calls. I rate my singing calls into four major categories. Category number one is new. Now, when I get a new singing call, I don't put it anyplace else except into that new category. Because I'm not going to judge a singing call until I've seen how the dancers react to it. I want to know what the, I get back. And I have to, I'm, I can't throw a singing call on right away and do it good. I have to work at it. And the more I use a singing call, the more I get different ideas of what to do with that singing call. So my new singing calls, I just have a, in my record case, it's new. Now on that singing call, those new singing calls, I put another sticker on there. I actually have two stickers. I put one sticker on there, new, and then I put the date that it goes into my case as a new singing call in that category. 
I use that singing call for 30 days. And in that 30 days, I'm aware of what happens, how my floors react to it, the different things I can do with it. At the end of 30 days, I make a decision. I'm either going to keep it, I'm going to throw it away, or if I keep it, I'm going to put it into some category. Is it an old standard singing call? Is it an upper or what? And that's how I handle my new ones. Once I've made that decision, then it rotates into whatever file I'm going to use it. Second major category special singing calls. Now, I have one, two, three, five categories under that major heading. Category number one, dance openers. Singing calls that I want to use when I open a dance, whether it's a club dance, whether it's a festival, whether it's a party night or a Saturday night or I'm on the road. But they're singing calls I want to use to open a dance with. And that's where I use them. Dance closers. Singing calls I want to use to close my dance off with. Floor raisers, rabble rousers, whatever you want to call them. Singing calls that create a mood out there that will raise them up. Rhythm changes. I believe every caller, every dance, should have at least one rhythm change record in there. Now, you can use 6 8 rhythm, you can go to Latin rhythm. Something in there that is a different rhythmical change. The dancers sense it, and they will react with it. Then I have, a, under my specials, I have what I call top hits. Records that have been on the charts that dancers relate to. Forever and Ever, Amen. Randy Travis's big hit. If, now, there's we're eight companies that produce it, so if you don't have it, out of those eight companies, you can find one of them that has it. But that is, that's an idea of what we call, I call a top hit tone. Something that a tune, a song that's been on the hit parade. One that, that dancers can react to. One that they recognize. One that they like. Next category, sing-alongs. Have you ever, and I'm sure you have, looked out there when you're doing a singing call and watch the dancers, watch those mouths singing along on the chorus lines. Dancers like to dance to singing calls they recognize. They like to dance to singing calls they can sing along with. They enjoy it. And if you can get your dancers to sing in with you, what have you got? You really got crowd control. Because now they're not only physically participating in it, they're vocally and mentally participating in it. Now I break my singing calls down into five groups. Love songs. I don't know why I love you like I do. It's a love song. And dancers can sing along to it. Next one, old standards, old classics. These are singing calls that go way back. Hell, they can go back to the 30s. And if you look at our average age, what, do you, what, what is the average age of our dancer today? What do you, is it getting younger or older? Older, isn't it? It's getting older. And they really relate to old classic singing calls that are singing along. They can really do. Do you agree with that? Are you shaking your head? Agreeing with him or disagreeing with me? Mike? <laughs> Crooner type. There are sing-alongs that you can get up there and you can really croon to. You can do your thing. You can do your Frank Sinatra or your Bing Crosby to it. And every caller should have some of those. And you should have them in there. Comic type. There's got to be some comic sing-alongs out there. Oh, I can't even think. I went through. I didn't bring my record case, so I went madly downstairs and looked for some comic ones, and I couldn't find any. I was going to play some. A uh, happy mood sitting. Uh, smile, darn you, smile is one. But something that establishes a mood in a sing-along where dancers can sing with you. Those. And then my fourth category in singing calls is just old standards. This is a singing call that really, it's just one you can throw on there and do any time in the middle of your dance. It's one that some like, some don't, some will, some I know. Uh, but you've got to have some old standards in your... Whether, now, when I say old standards, they don't have to be an old record. They can be a new record, but they're just standard-type singing calls because you don't want to have, what, rabble-rousers every tip. You don't want to do a festival tip of singing calls every tip. You want, you've got to have a graph that goes up and down with them. And those are my major categories. The other thing I do on my singing calls, I keep track of every singing call that I use and the night I used it and the group I called it to. 
I have a lot of groups that the same dancers will dance with me three nights a week. I can't use the, the same singing calls on Wednesday night that I used on Monday night because some of those same dancers are going to be there and they're going to come up to me and yeah, 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 yeah. you know how they are? Why are you always doing that one singing call? So I keep track of them. And I try to rotate them through my groups so I do not do the same singing call in a two-week period. Words. This club will have different singing calls this week and different singing calls next week. The following week, they might have one out of that group that they did the first week. How to program your music. Be sensitive to your music. Be sensitive to it the way the dancer is. Now, if you're sensitive to your music and you know what it is and you set up some kind of a system so you know what each record is, what each record can do for you, what each, what each record can do for the dancer, now you can be sensitive to that music. Another way of being sensitive is know what is in that music. That music has some highs. It's got some low points in it. It's got some jab points in it. You now, where you can raise your voice up, you can go up a quarter of an octave, you can do things. Analyze that music. Whenever I do a singing call, I'm always analyzing. I'm always watching what it does to the floor, especially brand new ones. And I always just keep a, a running note. Uh, I happen to use Hilton's record sleeves because I can write on them. I can't write on the plastic ones, so I use his so I can write on them. And I'll write on it what it does to a group. If I get a new singing call and I do it, and the group, yeah, and I've got groups that, <laughs> right between the middle of the singing call, they'll thumbs down on it right fast. <laughs> You've danced with them. Yeah, they will. And I'll just write down, no good. I will not base it on that one night, but I'll try it a couple more nights, and if I get the same kind of a reaction, heck, I'm not going to keep it. It might be a good piece of music. It just doesn't fit me. But analyze what that music does. Be aware of everything within the music. And always remember up here, when you choose your music at a, a, just randomly, you know, you just reach out and pick it and throw it on, what do you do? You give up the psychological control that you want over those dancers. It'll make a big difference in it. All right. Keep your dancers' mental state changing all the time. In other words, don't, don't do love songs all the time. Don't do rabble rousers one right after another. Because it's the same mental state. Yes, Father, I told you once I get started that it's hard to shut me up. <laughs> I will. Keep their mental state changing. And you can change it by the hoedowns and the singing calls that you use. You don't want to shoot them up here to the top and keep them up at the top and keep them going across, do you? You want to start bringing them up and let them dip a little bit. Let them dip down a little bit and relax. Then let them bring them up a little bit more. Then let them dip down a little bit. Change that mental attitude. You know what that does? It eliminates boredom. How many times have you had dancers come up and say, ah, I'm getting tired of square dancing. It's boring. Well, they're looking for some changes. You can get those changes not only in your choreography but in the music that you use. One thing to... Always remember, never use the same label back to back. You know what I mean by that? Never use the same label for your hoedown and your singing call. I change I, I, I change constantly through the labels that I'm using. If you use the same label, what have you got? Same music, same sound. What does it do to the dancers? It becomes monotonous. They hear the same style. So change it. And with the record companies that we've got out today, my gosh, you can just have everything you want. Jack says four to five minutes, and i probably got, what, three left? I haven't been counting. All right, about that. All right, let's talk about programming now. Let's take the first tip, the first tip of the evening. That first tip is going to set your mental, mental attitude of your dancers throughout the night, not only theirs but yours. If you set a good mental attitude, what is it going to do? It's going to come right back to you. Right back to you. So, you want to use music that says what? Let's dance. Let's have a good time. Let's be happy. Let's enjoy ourselves. How many of you are going to get up there the first tip and call DBD mainstream, huh? If you do, uh, you program different than I do. So you're going, to, you're going to use choreography of what? Get them started, get them rolling, get them warmed up, get them acquainted with you, get them to feeling comfortable. Your music should be the same thing. The people want to say, I'm happy, we're going to have a good time. What kind of a singing call to use your first tip? Use something that tells them the same thing. 
identically the same thing. Uh, I I use things like uh, I'll throw on a roll out the barrel, depending on the age of the group. Let me say that. Roll out the barrel I use a lot. Roll out the barrel, we'll have a barrel of fun. Now, it's an old song. Some guys think it's kind of hokey. I use one that I recorded, Tear Down the Walls. Tonight we're going to tear down the walls. We're going to dance and sing and laugh and have a ball. Get a singing call that fits you, that tells them exactly what they're going to do and what's going to happen, what's going to, what they're going to be. Sing-alongs. Get a sing-along singing calls into your choreography, into your middle stream. Let dancers sing. I don't have enough time to do it. Take a singing call. Uh, does everybody know, uh, this happens to be one I recorded, but, but let me use it. Does everybody know, Kiss Me Once, Kiss Me Twice? You know what that, that song is? Kiss me once, kiss me twice, kiss me once again. It's been a... All right. I still ain't hired. <laughs> All right. N- next time you have a singing call that you're going to do in the middle of your dance, that's a, sing- a sing-along singing call. Try this. Just try it. Put that on, and when you get to that certain part of the chorus line at the ending, just turn your music down and don't say a word. Just look at them. Now you'll hear, you'll, just like we did here, you'll hear a few weeks, a few little weak noises coming out. The next time you do it, it'll be a little bit stronger. The next, by the time you got into the middle break, the entire floor will be singing with you. Now how do they feel? They feel great. That's programming your music, programming what you're going to do. You got to have some middle of the road ones in there, and then you got to have something on a closer. And Jack's looking at me down here. If we have any more time, we'll go into it some more. Thank you. I do apologize, but we're trying to keep it down, and it's very difficult for somebody to try to explain things, and when we're trying to cut down the time, if we don't have that many questions, uh, we can get back to some things. Um, I think the bottom line is what he's saying is please prepare your programs. I know some of you say, I just go in there and I know what to do. Bull hockey. Plan ahead. Makes for a much better dance. Our next young man, and by the way, anybody here need money? Well, yeah, well, just one man, two guys were afraid to admit it. I see. Well, the next man, he's going to give you all the money you want. Tell you why. This man... His wife, Kathy, Jack O'Leary, is from Connecticut. And by the way, this man began calling 1961 at the age of 14, so you figure it out. He was taught by Red Bates. He served in the armed forces, still calling all the while he was in. He's done three international square dance conventions in Canada. He's been recording since 1976 with Top, TNT, and Red Boot Star Records. And in 1988, Jack decided to be his own producer of Silver Sounds Record. And what does he do? He's a vice president for the People's Bank of Connecticut. Take a look at this man. He deals in money. Let's be nice to him. Let's also have a nice warm welcome for Jack O'Leary, the owner-producer of Silver Sounds. Thank you, Jack. I, I know what I'll do tonight. I'll probably have se- several meetings that I hadn't planned on having. Nice to be here. I have some uh, some comments that are a little bit different than what you you just heard. Um, I'm going to be talking about di- digital sampling and synthesized music. I'm not going to make any determinations here, uh, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, just to let you know that it's here and a little bit about what it's all about. To put this in perspective a little bit, um, let's look back at, in the 1960s. When I first started, we were using 78s. Um, Windsor was the big label, McGregor. Um, the records weighed a ton <coughs> to carry them around. They had a very scratchy type of sound. It wasn't uh, what we hear today. Um, a lot of accordions. We don't hear too many accordions anymore. Uh, yeah. <laughs> violins. Then we had the appearance of the 45 record. And that kind of changed things. Uh, but the, the quality still wasn't there. Along about uh, 
the middle to the end of the 60s, early 70s, came Wagon Wheel. I'm not just picking out on these companies, but I, I think these are the ones that really made some changes. Wagon Wheel came out with a, a singing call called Hey Lily Lily. Some of you probably remember that. Still have it. <clears throat> yeah, we have it in our case. Uh, that, to me, represented a real significant change in the sound in square dance music, both from a, a performance standard and f a recording standard as well. In the 70s, uh, another label, TNT, uh, pioneered the synthetic sound. And again, whether you like it or you don't like it, it's here. And <clears throat> Companies like this have been fairly successful. In the 80s, we're dealing with digital sampling, and I'll get into what the difference between synthesized music and digital sampling is later. What happens in the 90s? Well, your guess is as good as mine. CDs. In the banking world, that's a certificate of deposit, but uh, <clears throat> in the recording world, it's a, uh, it's a disc. I, I foresee the time where we're going to have a couple of discs and we can pop them into a machine and program uh, where, where the location is and your hoedown is going to be right there. Um, same with singing calls. You'll be able to change your pitch and your speed independently of each other. So if the record is not quite in your key, uh, you just turn it down or turn it up, but it won't change the rhythm. Um, something we can't do now. So that's uh, that's... 30 years right there. Let me uh, talk a little bit about digital sampling. In layman's terms, and, and I have no background in electronics, if someone else does, I'd be glad to hear from you, maybe explain it a little more uh, detail, but digital sampling is the ability to take a sample with a computer in audio terms, taking a picture in audio terms. The picture might be very good, very clear or it might be very fuzzy. And that's all dependent on how many bits, computer bits of information the machine is capable of, of handling. Today, 16 to 18 bits is, is about the max in, in digital processors. The analogy I like to use is that back in uh, the 1960s, Polaroid developed a black and white instant camera called the Swinger. And uh, this was a pretty good little thing. You know, you take the picture and you wait a minute and you got a nice black and white picture and you had to coat it with something. Compare that to now where we've got 35 millimeter color pictures like that with no coating or anything. Sampling of sound does not utilize any sound storage. It's not like taking a recording device and, and, t and playing a clarinet and, and recording that and then storing it for later on. It's all computerized. The, the, the photograph of that sound in computer terms is, is kept in a memory and then it's integrated through the computer with some kind of a processing device. There was a gentleman by the name of Ray Kurzweil who uh, was an engineer, MIT grad, and in the 1970s he developed the optical reading scanner. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. This is a, a device for the blind. It's not a braille system. It's a device f for reading for the blind. And through the use of a wand, you take any written p material and you rub the wand across the page. It goes into a processor. It is then translated and put out the back end on a voice box, and it actually reads the book. Okay, It's a computer language, but, it, but for someone who is blind, this is great. Singer-composer Stevie Wonder used one of these, and he said, I want to meet the man who, who developed this. So he called Ray Kurzweil, and he said, um, I love your device. Can you do anything like this and have a musical application? So Kurzweil said, I'll give it a try. Kurzweil agreed to the challenge, and he called together a group of what I call electronic wizards, um, all of whom were musicians in their own right. And they went to work on a musical application for the, the scanner. He called together uh, his uh, chief engineer, it was Bob Moog, uh, who developed one of the first synthesizers, the, the Moog synthesizer. What they came up with was this thing. This is a Kurzweil modular expander. 
And what it does is, it is it's a sampling unit, and through a keyboard, various sounds of the orchestra can be duplicated extraordinarily close to the real sound, some better than others. This, this alone has changed the shape of the music industry. I have an article here in this magazine called, and the, and the headline says, uh, Though the synthesizer and the sampler have taken over the role of the string section in pop recording. And then it goes on. Uh, it's here, and, and we're dealing with it uh, in square dancing as well as every other kind of music. Singers like Lionel Richie are traveling around doing their performances with a Kurzweil unit. This is a little bigger deal, and they tandem these things. And instead of bringing a group of musicians that's going to cost them an arm and a leg, they travel with one person and one of these. And they can put on a concert, and the sound is outstanding. Cuts down on their expenses. Units range in price from uh, $2,500 to $50,000. My bank is uh, willing to talk to anyone. <laughs> now, I have to say, I, I don't own the bank. I just work there. Um, okay, Kurzweil's organization spent about $20 million in R&D on this, um, and he calls it the Pattern Designated Data Recognition System, um, which is a mouthful, and I have no idea what that means. Just briefly on synthesizers. Well, what is the difference then between something like this and a synthesizer? Synthesizers do not use the sampling process as described here. Rather, they are most of them are pre-programmed with electronic sounds, which can be shaped to imitate sounds. And they, some of them do pretty well. They imitate, but they are an imitation. This, is, this process is known as added synthesizing or subtracted synthesizing through the use of PCM codes or wavelengths, which again is, is kind of technical. Uh, here, the, the, the wave tables represent the picture of the sound, and that's stored in the memory and it's recalled and further articulated. If any of you are interested in learning more about the technical part of this, there's a couple of books. You might want to write them down or, or if when you hear this tape. One is called The History of Music Machines. It's by Drake Publishers, uh, prepared by the Smithsonian Institution. Another one is called Electronic Music by Andy McKay. It's published by Control Data. And then the American Engineering uh, Society of Audio Engineers um, in New York, 60 East 42nd Street. Uh, is another source. Now I have some uh, samples of, of some records. Do I have time to do this now? Since we have the use of a machine here, uh, I thought I'd play you some. Some of you will recognize and maybe some of you will be surprised. Gonna do the old fooling trick, huh? The old fooling trick. Okay. Let me uh, put this thing on here. Some of the uh, synthesizers and, and digital samplers that we use in, uh, in square dancing are uh, used in conjunction with other instruments. And here's one of the first uh, synthesized tunes on TNT. You can hear the synthesizer taking the lead there. But what else is interesting about this is that you got a nice bass sound, and you got something that sounds like a guitar strumming away. But it's that uh, melody line that is truly a synthesizer just being played on the keyboard. In fact, most of all the sounds on this are done by one person. Okay, that's enough of that one. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Here's one that uh, may surprise you. This is a neutron dance. So 
So some are more uh, obvious than others. Um, one of the things that, uh, that we've done, can I, I can play it my own, can I, here? Go ahead, then I won't have to do that. All right. Here's one we put out on, on Silver Sounds called Kokomo. This is done with a curse, well, like I described to you. Drum sounds are done with it through a drum machine. That sound that sounds like a trumpet is, is actually done through a keyboard. The Crizzle also has a nice uh, marimba sound. Okay. Uh, one more here. One of the things that the that the um, sampler has not been able to do, and that is a guitar sound, uh, or a saxophone for that matter. Kurzweil has uh, has worked this up, and he's got a, a a module that will create a guitar sound. I don't know for sure, but I think uh, TNT is using this. Um, listen to this one. You can hear guitar, and you can also hear something that sounds like a saxophone. Here's just a few examples of, of some of the ways that synthesizers and samplers are used in his great dance music. And I thank you very much for your attention. This ends side one. Please turn over tape to... What's coming next? The rumors are all out about the end of 45s and, and, and everything else. Um, at the NAM show, that's a show where they, all the electronic people get to show their new equipment, there's talk, and more than talk, that it's not the CD that may sneak in. The, sne the, the CD is, is obviously taken over, but I don't know if anybody here realizes there's something called the floppy disk or the solid disk. That is a very real possibility, callers, that we may be carrying around these little discs that do the same thing as 45s. What about the equipment? Talking to Hilton's engineer recently, he says if this happens, it would probably take him from the time it happens three years to change over his equipment. So it can be done. But these are all possibilities. So don't go out and stop buying records or, or melting up your plastic for the future. Okay? But this is, this is something that is happening. Um, and they say, why digital music? It's getting, it's getting better and better. It, it really is. Is it putting out musicians? Yeah, but it's putting a lot of others it, into work because it takes somebody to press the keys. And I would like to add something to, to Jack that maybe you may know or not know is that uh, some of the things that may be distasteful to you on the new sound, first of all, it is a case of economics. Mike Tromberly knew that a long time ago. The rest of us are finally learning. Okay, he's one of the early pioneers in this business, but it's getting better and better. The sounds that may turn you off, uh, if you remember, you remember before I said that what is melody, it's the sweet end of the lollipop. You're not used to hearing these sounds. You are becoming more and more used to hearing them now. Uh, when I talk about, he says that you can't get a saxophone. He's true. They haven't got the reason for sax, uh, saxophone, guitar, and even the trumpets are getting better. This is what we call the attack on the instrument. A keyboard's attack is very recognizable. Okay, Attack means how it goes in and how it comes out, the, the note. It's not right on, right out. 
in some of this equipment, including the Kurzweil, they have a mouthpiece that's happening right now. Yeah, a plastic tube like a trumpet mouthpiece. They plug in and they blow on it like a trumpet while hitting the keys or holding the note down to get the proper attack. So very shortly you're gonna you're gonna it's it's gonna be that way. Now I want to get to one part that's really something to me and it's happened again downstairs. It's called selecting or how to pick music. Keeping those three basic ideas in mind the rhythm the sound, uh, the melody, and the harmony. Uh, I'm just curious, and I don't mean to, to embarrass anybody. Um, how many here, when they're listening to a record, listen to the called side? Don't be embarrassed. Do you listen to the... Yeah, when you're buying a record, the first thing you do is put the called side on. Only. You're, you're, you've never heard the record, and you come in, you pick the record up, and you put the call side on to hear it and, and to listen to it. How many do that? Okay, can I? I'm glad to see only a few, and and you, maybe you will argue with me, uh, or maybe not. Uh, took a long time for me to realize, uh, of course, knowing somewhat about music, there's such a thing as called subliminal suggestion. And a long time ago, you remember advertising had a problem; they would flash something up there, and you'd go buy it. You didn't need a dress on, guys, but you went and bought it anyway. <laughs> Well, that's almost the same thing with a piece of music. It, it happens every time we come to a convention. We go to one of these these places. And, Dick, I'll give you a chance to kick me out in, in ten minutes, okay? Um, in case I forget. No, I'm serious, please, at 2.30. Uh, because we want to give them some time. Um, the um, When you hear something, I've had a guy, it just happened today. He never once... Even listen to the other side. He knew the record was not for him. He put the singing call side on. He heard no more than four to six bars. Put it aside. While looking at some other records, he didn't want it. While looking at some other records, another caller came up and played the instrumental side. He then leaned over, put his ear to it, and said, interesting. And he bought the record. I, I don't... You get that suggestion. It's not going to help you. If you keep the three basics in mind, melody, the sweet end, the rhythm, the driving force, and the harmony, don't worry about listening to that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a record on, instrumental. I, well, first of all, questions come back. I don't know the melody. That's why I listen to the caller. Uh, that's not going to help you any. Put the record on, listen to it. And first of all, is it sweet to you? Yeah, you're listening to the sweet end. You like the melody? It's not bad. Hum along to it. Do it like a patter. Look for the high end. If you can hit that high end, terrific. It might even be harmony that you're hitting. Okay? Listen to how it feels to you. You hum with it. You sing with it. Don't matter if you're in key uh, all the time with it. But have fun with it. It's interesting. Play with it a little bit more. And I would think in a few seconds or even playing through the whole thing, finding out if it's got a middle break to it, you may not like it. Find out if it's got a key change to it. You may not like key changes or modulations. The same thing. But listen to the instrumental side first. That way you will not... If you've got to listen to the other sides because perhaps you don't know the phrasing. And let's hope the caller on the other side phrased it right for you. I can't hit the high end. I can't hit the low end. Don't listen to the caller. He may be one of those guys that can sing way up there. I know a couple of callers that work with me on the label. They can sing pretty high. Uh, we just did a recording session with Mr. Guy Adams. The gentleman can sing. He's got a pair of shorts that must be tight. <laughs> That young guy can sing, he could break glass. I got a couple of guys like that. But what he did is, after the caller listens to that record, perhaps going to turn over and say, well, it's not as high as I thought it was. Look at here. He's singing this. What is he doing? He's singing a, a, a harmony. Let's break that down and, uh, and listen to a piece of music, a couple of pieces right now. There are many good good pieces of music, but as I was going down the line, I don't care if you like anything that I'm doing here, what I'm trying to tell you right at this moment is listen to the sweet end of the lollipop, is, is which is the melody line, of course the rhythm, that continuous beat that's going to drive the dancer. Boom chuck, I was going to put all these rhythm, different rhythms on, but we're not going to have time for that. But the most common of course is the boom chuck or the shuffle, boom chuck is the 2-4, could be fast 4-4. Four, four. Um, if you want to know more about rhythms, I will gladly talk with you afterwards. But the boom chuck, the boom is telling the dancer where to put his feet. Put one here, boom, you put one there, boom. So what's the chuck or the chick? Well, you go burlesque shows, you'll know what that chuck means. That's a boom, chuck, 
boom, chuk, okay? That tells the dancer to move. The chuck is the move. Boom, chuck, boom, chuck, okay? That's your best type of rhythm to make the dancers move. When we have time, I'll tell you about me as a musician at 17 years old. I learned that boom chuck real good in burlesque places, being playing the drums. When I put this on, I'm not going to say no more than go ahead and listen to the melody. For yourself, you know, that's a nice melody. You probably have this record in your case. Listen to the rhythm in it. But most of all, the thing we never listen to, listen to all the runs and the harmonies, the nice thing that makes this whole package maybe for you. Here we go. It's a perfect, it breaks this basic three down perfectly. Telling you where to go? Oh! Sweet melody. Here's the piano tickling in the background. It's lips. That's fun. That's complimenting that sweet end of that lollipop. Oh. Yes, sir. Wade has learned a lot from me. <laughs> Wade, if you listen to this tape, I'm only kidding. The name of that is Snap Your Fingers. That's right. Now, I can go on and on and on, and I'm not trying to avoid anybody or put special people on here. Let's listen to this one, for instance. I'm not going to tell you what it is. It may be in your case. It may not. But let's, again, listen to something that's going to tell you a story about this record. I'm not putting on the people's call. But he's telling you right away how sweet it is. Okay, are you listening to all three parts? Do it all the time. That is, by the way, no plug for the gentleman, but it is Buckskin, Million Dollar Baby. Okay? Play one more for you. Do I have time, guys? I figured if I played that record, he'd give me that couple more minutes. Um, well... They're basically all the same. I really don't, you know, I don't want to get into a, a lot of different. We could, we could be. Well, here is a here is a perfect example on this one here, um, of the the harmony. Again, please understand that harmony doesn't mean singing in thirds, right note for note with somebody. That's not true. Let's just say, in, in, to make it understandable for all of us, harmony is everything that melody and rhythm is not. Okay. This is this is a good little piece right here. Again. This is Chaparral. And you're listening to the melody line. He's way up there. He can't do it. Listen to the riffs that are going on. Maybe you can pick on that note for the riff. A perfect example of a record that was too high and nobody can do, but it happens to be my bestseller, was Beautiful Noise. Nobody could hit those high notes. But everybody was buying a record. Eventually, people were learning, you didn't have to sing that high. If you listen to it, we gave you enough harmony there to find another note. So, listen to the, the music side of it, please. Listen to all the basic three. It will help you sing the song. It will help you pick a song and not have them all sitting in your box and never able to do it. When you hear another caller do the other side, I know there's no such thing as a bad caller. The bad callers are not in this room. They're in other sessions. Okay? The thing is, subliminally, you will be influenced, good or bad, by a caller, no matter what you say. Same to you, fella. What is this? Oh, just checking. Um, you will be influenced. Uh, the biggest influence I've ever seen is some of our great callers. 
and, I, and, and that really do. And in fact, I can point out one incident on my side is a man named Greg Edison, who did one of the first records with me. The kid sings all over, sings real good. Somebody puts the record on and says, that's a good record. He sings good. I can't do it. I can't use it. That's the opposite. But he's too good. Tony Oxidine sings all over the place. Oh, wow. I can't do that. The opposite happens. The ego gets in the way. Look at, listen to Tony. <laughs> I can do that. Gets it home. He can't use the record. Don't listen to anybody on the other side, please. It ain't going to help you any. Listen to him later. Now, I know a lot of you guys record and say, what do you mean? Don't listen to me sing. I want you to listen to me sing. Don't fool yourself. Music's important. What's important for the side is the phrasing to help us callers in case we do not know how to phrase. That's what it's about. That's how you pick a record. Don't listen to the call side. It ain't going to help you. I'll, I'll give you free records from now to the rest of your life. You can prove to me that it works by listening to the call side. I want to end this because I did have a lot of other things that I wanted to cover. We talked real quick. If, do I still have a couple of minutes? We talked about synthesizers and, and the people who have made a change in our music business. And where is it going in 90 and 91 and all that kind of thing. Well, we're, we're pretty well where it's happening. What we've got to worry about is what's happening to the 45s, and I really wouldn't worry about that. Jack mentioned, I believe, Wagon Wheel. Chaparral has been a big influence on us. Rhythm Records told everybody it's not necessary to have accordions, trumpets, and xylophones. Rhythm says we can sound just like the pop radio stations. He changed the, the whole line. Red Boot was not afraid to experiment. TNT says, economically, this is not going to happen. It's going to change. They did see the future. Jack, I think, said something about, uh, one of the things I think is the closest in duplicating a synthesizer, I had to play this because I just kind of, uh, this is a Blue Star thing. I'm just wild about Mary, or if you're in my neighborhood, wild about Harry's, okay. <laughs> we just sing for all those guys. I like the plunking of the strings. It fascinates me. Listen when we get to the feet. Let's move it on a little bit. Blue Star has gone this way. All the music now. You may not like it. You'll get used to it. It's going to get better. It's going to get fuller. Come on, do me the strings. Come on. I love that. I love that. That's a change. That is so... That's the sweet end of the lollipop. That ain't so hard to take. Horns bother me. I'm a horn man. I'm a drummer. They haven't perfected it as far as I'm concerned. It does bother me. But that's kind of nice. It's smooth. I don't know any producer who couldn't afford 101 strings to plunk. Do you? Except maybe uh, Elmer Sheffield. He can afford to have 101 strings. I can't do that. Uh, I want to show you one more thing, and then I want to get off here and open it up to the floor, if I may. Um, I misplaced the record, and by golly... That's all right, Jack. That's called being organized. By the way, um, horns, like I said, I'm not going to do it. I don't have... Oh, here it is. What's going to happen to the music like me uh, or some of us who still use... I'm slowly changing. I like the combination of two. I think that is the happy medium. If that's called sitting on a fence, I guess it is. I want an honest opinion what you think this music is made up out of. Is it? Or is it not? Yes, it's one of mine. It's the only one I can demonstrate. Listen to all of them. The sweet melody. Again, are you listening to all three parts all the time? Listen. In your head, sing with it. Pace with it. Is the rhythm going to move you anywhere? This is a back four. It's not a book shot. It's a driver. This is telling you to stamp your feet a little harder. Right? Okay? That's what it's telling you. It's another kind of rhythm. Okay. Do you think that's all real music? Huh? I'm not trying to trick you. Do you, do you is this listening to is everything on their real musicians? Yes. <laughs> yes. But I'll tell you what, I wasn't trying to fool you. The only thing in there that is, is the drum machine. But it's working with a real drummer. Okay? I am a drummer. And there's nothing that can substitute the creativeness as a human being. 
And through the drums, we hook up our drummer to the drum machine. So the, ba- the heavy beat will be constant. But anything else creative, drum rolls and all that, is due to the drummer. Okay, we're going to open this up. I, you know, again, I apologize. I think we have, we have a whole half hour here. If we have to cover other things, we will. We'll jump in. See, do you have any questions at all about anything? Yes. Uh, why don't you come up here, so because we're on, and we want to hear your name and your question. Uh, Phil Gamash from New Hampshire. I have a situation where I hear from the dancers a lot that it's too fast. And I think what I'm hearing from them in the last record you had on is a good example. When there's a lot of activity in the record, a lot of notes, they perceive that as being faster, even though it isn't. Good observation, except for the fact that certain beats make it sound faster. A shuffle, all all music, all my music, and I know Dick and, and Jack, I'm sure, have done it that way. We work from 128 beats to 131. I stay around 129. It's really up to you callers to pace the floor. But what you're saying is if it sounded fast, it's usually that hard beat. Always sounds like you're moving faster. Yes, sometimes the music creates the movement, and they tend to rush. Anybody else? Yes, right here. Frank Kieser from Belleville, Illinois. I, I want to take exception with one thing. He, he, he made a remark about not using two records back-to-back on the same label. Uh, if it's good music, I see nothing wrong with this. I can't believe the people got tired of Glenn Miller. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to respond to that? Well, <laughs> was he a square dance caller? No. Oh, I was. <laughs> well, help me out. I ain't that old. <laughs> I'm a greaser. I don't know better. <laughs> um, do you want to respond to that? Well, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not trying to put words in Dick's voice, uh, 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 mouth, but he did say that's a matter of choice. And sometimes it does happen. Some songs are so similar that that may be a case. Some maybe not. Jack, in the program, Glenn Miller varied his um, music tremendously uh, through what we would call a tempo and uh, he would have slow ones, he would have fast ones. Yes, right. Yes, and he was making the same that Glenn Miller did vary his music to slow to fast, even in the same song. Well, we obviously can't do that because the dancers would be like falling off the end of the cliff. The good looking guy, not the ugly one here. Uh, Irwin West. <laughs> Irwin West, Vermont. Uh, interesting thing, uh, you mentioned not using the records back-to-back because of uh, the types of instrumentation and so on. But now we're talking about synthesized music. (laughs) God, we're even getting into dialogue here that I can't even uh, handle as a caller. But uh, aren't we going to take and uh, start producing uh, music that is using the same type of uh, production and get similarities in in the production, or are we going to be able to get the variety? I'm going to let one of these guys answer. I'll tell you, in my opinion, no. Give us time. I can tell TNT from Jax. What makes... If I'll tell you right now. You can walk into a studio, same musicians, okay? But let's make a change. Same studio, same musicians, change engineer, change the producer. You're not going to know the difference. I have two labels that people swear up and down that I've got a different band. It's not. Change engineers, change the method. You guys want to answer that, Jack? I know. Keep the big mouth shut. (laughs) Yes. Dean Fischel from Minnesota. I was wondering why uh, on a given night my wife may say the same record sounds slower or faster than the night before and still it looks the same on the strobe. Huh? You're, you're, what you're, let me see if I get the question right. What you're asking is that you're using the same scene call tonight then use that scene call again tomorrow night and she says the tempo sounds different. Well, you've got two things. Number one, your delivery, how you're doing it. You may be doing it different. Now, you can take a singing call, and if you put more words into it, it's faster. It will sound faster. It will sound more hectic to the dancer. If you cut your words and start using uh, it, will sound slower or more melodic. Depends. That's what I see as the difference. One, one, other, one other thing that that might be is if on Friday night you were in a hardwood floor, 
and you call that dance, and then Saturday night you're on a slippery tile, it's going to feel different. Right here. Do you actually like the synthesized music, or are you just getting used to it? What's your name? Dave Kroll. Dave Kroll from uh, Indiana. Do we like the music, or is it that we're getting used to it? I want to let each one of us answer. Uh... I'm be honest with you. I don't know yet. I've been a musician for 30 years. Uh, he hates it. Okay. I don't know yet, but I do know there's a lot of nice stuff happening, and I think I think I'm going to like it. I think I'm going to like right now. I'm doing it in combination of two. Yeah, I would tend to agree. The, you know, the ballot's not in yet on this. As Jack mentioned, a lot of this stuff is new technology, and. Uh, my own feeling on it is that I, I like it with um, a combination of other instruments. You know, you can't get a five-string banjo sound out of one of these, and you can't even get a good fiddle out of one of these yet. I'm repeating what, what they said. If I have my druthers, I would rather have all live musicians in the studio. That would be my choice. If I could afford to do it, I would do it. But uh, a lot of our songs that we're doing today, we, we like some sweet strings in the background. You cannot go out. If you went out and you hire a string section, you're looking at $400 to bring that string section in. That's just the cost of the musicians. Now you got studio time on top of that. But we can take a Kurzweil and get a beautiful, sweet string sound in the background. So uh, there's a combination there that yeah, in, in economics. In fact, someone just said to me... Uh over here, it says, you know, do you, do you guys want to pay for more for your records than they already are? Yeah, well, I don't blame you. But there's a happy medium. Yes. Jim Park from Michigan. Um, in response to the gentleman that was talking about uh, sometimes a song seems faster than others, I think an awful lot of the callers today are not too... Some of them are not properly timing their music with using figures that time out. And uh, uh, possibly maybe you were uh, calling a dance one night and used a different figure the next night. doesn't quite time out. took a couple more beats to get the uh, dancers uh, through that figure, and that might be why it uh, seemed faster. Very good. You know, we, um, we were talking. We never covered one very important thing, is just letting music do the work for you. There's no reason that you have to sing on every note and every beat. That's why producers or anybody try to put in special things in the middle of the record. We said that uh, uh, Glenn Miller, uh, during his play, it was slow and speeded up. We can't change that tempo, but we can certainly drop out music so the dancers get a change and callers take advantage of those changes. You don't have to sing on those breaks. I don't like grand squares. They're so boring. We do them all the time. Well, you know, <laughs> find something else. You know, you're creative people. Any other question? I'm sorry. Yes. Please come on up here. You bet. Dan McCordack from Oregon. And I, I don't believe it's so prevalent anymore, but there was a time when the third time through the figure, the musicians went crazy. Is that still, is that still the case, and why? Okay, that's a good question. Believe it or not, there was something I wanted to... To, to do um, I'll try to cover this and then you want to cover it too I, I'm sorry I, I'm taking the mic on you all I'm going to say is what you're saying is the music is getting kind of monotonous the musicians aren't letting go or they are letting go at the end the yeah some of the some of the producers including me when I first started I was afraid to let it go or let the musicians uh, take off. Because when we're calling, I've heard a lot of callers say, it's too busy and I'm getting confused. That's because nobody would let the music work for them. When you're listening to a record, as I said, listen to the whole record. I'll tell you what I do now. I start nice and easy and I'll build it up. It's a natural build up for you. Yes, in one of perfect example of records is I Got Rhythm on Chicago Country. My friend who does all my guitar work, I'll tell you, he, he works. If you ever see Wayne Newton, you see the guitarist. That's my friend and that's who does my music. He always knew that in square dancing that, I know Jack, don't let loose. I'll try to keep it nice and simple. So one day we were feeling real good, and then I got rid of them. I says, ah, the heck with them callers. Have fun. Take a listen at that third figure and beyond. We're having fun.
but I think maybe why some have simmered down was because they're afraid that we may get too busy for the caller. We're doing the same thing. My guitar player, the guy that plays all, does all my guitar work, my steel guitar work, is Terry Christofferson, who is the lead guitar man for Buck Owens. If you ever see Buck Owens, and you see that guy, that's that, that blonde-looking guy with that silly grin playing the steel there, that's Terry Christofferson. Fantastic man. He plays eight-string instruments. But when I get him in the studio and, and we're laying it down, he wants to get carried away at times, and we have to hold him back. And about the fourth, third or fourth time down there, we say, all right, Start stretching your strings, and that means get a little out of the melody. Get a few hot licks in there. By that time, you should have the melody down in your head pretty good where you can go through it. What we're trying to do is help you. We're trying to excite you a little bit more, so you in turn will excite the dancer out there a little bit more. More change in the music. Anybody else? Please. And, you know, even think about you know why do we do something in the studio. Anything, please. Yes, can you come up? I'd pull the set off the table, but uh, Dick uh, at Hilton would get mad. Harry Peterson from Ottawa, Canada. You were just saying that you can't afford these musicians. Why? Are they quitting, charging themselves out of business and going on welfare? So then we've got to put up with this new stuff whether we like it or not. Is this... No, that's not... Harry, we're trying to find better ways... Uh, we have to give cha changes are awful hard to take. It's awful hard to take for me being a musician for 30 years and seeing keyboards replace me. My son is a drummer, a very good drummer. You know what else he does? Takes up the digital display and he's learning to comp the, the computer with the drums. When he goes in as a drummer, what do you want? My sticks or my fingers? He's one of the smart ones. No, I think you're going to be a happy medium, Harry. I wouldn't let it worry you. We're, we're, are they making charging us too much time? It's really the studio that's killing us. Yeah, I, I can't speak to uh, to the cost of studio musicians uh, directly, but um, I, as I said before, a happy medium. The combination of your acoustic instrument plus some kind of synthesizer in the in the background or taking a lead, uh, I think is where we're going to be for a little while. You know, the same things were said when rhythm came in. Who wants all that stark guitar and steel stuff coming in? It takes time. You know, you're talking about uh, studio time. I, we went on a tour when we first got here. And when, on the tour, we, were, uh, we stopped at a studio. Maybe some of you went there. I don't know. But I, I listened to the fellow, and uh, then as I walked out, I walked over and I said, uh, you know, do you have some rates? that you could uh, give me an idea of what it costs to uh, make a blank here or do something. He says, well, he says, we only do our own stuff, but he says, there are a few studios around that would probably take care of you, uh, maybe starting in 5000 at $5,000. And I think that gives you a real idea of just what you're going to run up against if you want to go into a studio and do something. We're really being treated very well. Uh, through the record producers as to the cost of producing. Thank you. There are many people, as you know, start their own records and are finding out that uh, you get what you pay for. Just keep that in mind. I don't I really want to have a question, but I think you might elaborate on the numbers of records that you sell versus what, say, the pop music industry sells as an illustrating point of why the cost is so much more a factor for you all than it is for Thank you for asking that question. Uh, I do want to respond, and I think these gentlemen will too. The question was, is how many records do we sell compared to the pop labels? Oh, my goodness gracious. A real hot seller for us. And this for me, uh, and I can't speak for anybody else. I have some that are selling way up there, and but I think around a 1,000 records. Um, but I think that's not just due, and that's a good seller in most cases. In fact, 500 might even be a good seller right now. What we have, gentlemen, is a very poor marketing system in our records. It, it amazes me when some of you callers come by and say, when did you do this one? And I say, two years ago. Or you come by and say, oh, we thought you guys were out of business. You know, uh, that's what we sell. I, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. It's a limited market, very limited. 
and and the sales really vary. We also have a production cost thing that the plants that do the pressing. When we go in and press, we press a thousand records against what a pop company will press a hundred thousand. So what they have to do is set their presses up for us to press a thousand. They're charging us an awful lot more per unit to press those thousand than they are the, the plant that comes there to, and presses a hundred thousand. So all of those variables enter into our cost. As a as a relatively new company, under a year old, we're selling between 350, 400 records um, each release. I'm satisfied with that for right now, and. Uh, you know, as Jack says, you, you go in and you do a thousand of them. We, we have the the other problem that we don't want to cut a thousand at one time. We'll go to 500 if we need to go back and do another 500. Great, but that that ups the expense again. I could smoke you and tell you that we we sell a lot of records. We're very fortunate. We sell enough records, okay, in this business to, to keep going. I just love it. That's all. So he was first, and then and then you. And believe me when I say you got to love the business to do it. <laughs> Music is the only thing for me right now. Charlie Deal from Massachusetts. I'd like to get back to the uh, letting the musicians go on the uh, third go-around of the chorus. Uh, I think this has implications for the tape services. And I think that those of us who use the tape services need to be warned, and I think you need to get to the tape services to uh, talk to them about that. Thank you, Charlie. Very good point. Could you just address uh, royalties and ASCAP and that type of thing? We have run into it at conventions where people have stood around and watched us and listened and made some accusations. And can you tell them, you know, especially some of the round dance? <laughs> well, the round dance, the, I'm not afraid to, to answer that. The round, dance, the round dance people have the problem. I really, I really don't want to. In, in, the, in the cases that they're using somebody else's musicians and everything else, it's a, it's a whole other situation. It is being handled. I guess Roundance is doing their thing, and we're doing our thing. I have a letter on file with ASCAP, um, being a limited distribution. Uh, you know, you, where you get in trouble is if you're pumping out a few hundred thousand records and you're not clearing it. Um, but as <clears throat> what I found out when I started was that if I, as long as I have a letter on file telling them what I do and, and about what I think I'm selling and distributing, uh, I'm covered. I think what Jack was referring to was the round dance cures more than the music. As callers, let me tell you what was happening out on the West Coast. The callers that own their own halls and are holding dances are having to purchase an ASCAP license for the hall itself as a dance hall. That's what's happening out there. They're not being, having to buy a license or paying royalties as a performer on the stage, but they have to buy that license as it. And they've hit a number of the halls already. I, I, uh, to add something to that ASCAP thing, I'm not going to mention any labels or that, but a real short funny story is that one of the labels was says, hey, you using our music, we want 3.5% of your, your gross. So this producer sent them $28. <laughs> so, what Jack says was happening. Yes, back there. Please come on up. Well, I'll tell you, both come on up. Um, you get the little guy, get behind the big guy. Or if you're tougher than the big guy, uh, then you get up here. I really don't. Don't sit there and argue. Get up here. Hi, Leah. Um, What's your name? <laughs> My name is Joe Frisella. I'm from Rhode Island. And in the caption here it says, This session is designed to discuss music and how it relates to, to the overall activity of square dancing. And I was very pleased to hear you say, uh, Don't listen to the singing side, because uh, I'm very concerned about the choreography and how uh, most people uh, call us are trying to impress us by what they know and how much they can say and how fast they want us to run. But most of these records, and I'm disappointed in some of the record companies, they haven't done something about it, uh, that they, they ought to have the choreography meet the music. Time out. Time out. Good question. I'm, I'm at fault with that, and I think sometimes, the, in my case, the concern is more with the music 
and I forget the other part, and I do rely on the callers who are working on my label to do the job. And uh, that's my answer, and I'm not trying to cop out of it. We're getting better. You have the other the other consideration too, and, and we don't have a, a buy on label. Do y'all know what buy on labels are? Anybody with a few hundred dollars uh, submits an idea, and they do it. Uh, there is uh, not as much quality control as we would all like. Um, there are a couple of companies out there that that do that. They review. Uh, I used to do one. Uh, they review all all figures, and and I got some counseling when I was on another label that uh, from a gentleman sitting in this room that told me that one of the things you want to do, uh, Mr. Bayon Caller, is keep the figure simple and, and work on it. Make sure that it works before you put it in to your singing call. We try as hard as we can to make the choreography match the music and time out as well as possible. Larry Cole back there records for me. Larry, what was your phone bill last month on your last, your most current re release? Just to you? Yes, just to me. All right, my phone bill was over $60 back to Larry trying to make sure that everything danced. So we, I'm not saying that we're perfect, but we try as hard as we can. Ray Taylor, are you back there? Yeah. What's your last phone bill to me on yours? <laughs> We're trying. We hear one side that, why are you guys keeping it simple? Please come on up here. Why are you guys keeping it simple? Give us something else. Some say, why are you doing it? Just make sure it's simple and it's timed out. Fine. What this means to me is, and please do not take this as an insult, we have one of the greatest timers right here right now, Mr. Dick Ledger. What it appears to me is that, yes, I'm at fault, but do you guys really need us as a crutch or can you do it yourself? Okay, I don't know what to do. I keep hearing you keep telling us producers two different things. But the worst is that some of these do not time out, and I am probably, in my early ones, at fault. I'm Dak Dak from Arlington, Virginia. I'm a caller coach. I'm involved in training a lot of the young callers that are coming up. Uh, I endorse what you're trying to do. I think you gentlemen are doing a better job of putting the choreography and the timing to the music than has been in the past. I'm seeing a good change. Some of us have been hammering at it, and it's happening. Uh, there's one thing further, however. New callers, when they first decide to call, pick up a record. And the first thing they do is turn over the side and listen to the caller. On that side, we old-timers made a lot of mistakes when we were coming up, and all of our mistakes are being copied on every record. And it continues and continues. And when I get in here and I say, young fella, preempt that phrase of music. Get that call in ahead of that command. Get that command in there before that first beat starts. Let's get started doing it right. He says 99% of everything else I listen to doesn't do it. So how are you doing so big, Bill? And we would appreciate it, fellas. Now, I don't know of a singing call that starts uh, wrong. It's always circle left. And there goes the beat. From there on, they forgot it. The preempt isn't there. We'd like to see a little more of you. If you can get your, your people who are recording to consider that a little harder, it'll help us. Thanks, Deco. We're going to come up here with about a one-minute conclusion. I want to thank all of you for your positive input. We've got to learn from each other, and somebody like Dick Ledger, Deco Deck, give us time, guys. We're learning. Let's hear just a little bit. A little bit from Mr. Jack O'Leary, our newest kid on the block. Well, I think judging by the, uh, the level of conversation here today, there, there is some changes. Change is inevitable. Um, I'd like to get off of that for a minute and, and kind of close by uh, just uh, sharing with you a comment that was made at the lunch table today. Um, I was with a group from Canada, and we got talking about how we end up a dance. Um, and I said, you know, after we talked about it, this is something I'm going to mention in this uh, seminar here. Um, just give me a show of hands. How many callers, when you finish the dance and your people are coming up to say goodnight, how many put the record back on the turntable? A few, a few. That's that's just the nicest touch. Uh, as people are coming back, uh, shaking hands, saying uh, they enjoy themselves, uh, whether you got 20 squares or whether you got three, uh, it just is something that, that I've found has worked for me. Oh, yes, definitely turn it down. But it just kind of warms up everything as people are leaving. Yeah, you don't want it so loud that you can't hear the, the people talking to you. But I found that that's a, an excellent little tip, and it, and it just uh, finishes off that evening uh, very nicely. What happens if they start squaring up? You're, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> 
to reinforce what Jack said a little bit, as producers, we're in the business to sell records, and you're the end receiver, and we want to do everything we can to make them as saleable as possible. So uh, work with us. Don't be afraid to say something, but when you say, I don't like something, tell us why you don't like it. Just that, not, I don't like it. 